my screen now. No. Hello. We are live. Hello, Bina. Yes, we are yes. live. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Hello. Good morning. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Morning's Culture. Yes, it's been very long. Uh, we were busy and uh, it was good busy. We were busy and uh, enjoying uh, other other things in life. But but yes, of course, we were missing this. Uh, missy yeah. being, missing being here and, uh, and missing mornings. Uh, which was available in some other form to us, then that is something really profound of life. And the uh, universe being so generous that uh, we have this, at least we have this ability to extract value and moreness in every situation. And uh, whenever one can be at that place, this is the, so far, of course, not the ultimate, but so far, this is the best state of being that you can wow. deliberately extract moreness out of every situation wow. Wow. and this is what uh, we were doing so welcome again and hopefully we will be doing uh, continuously and regularly these lives now from now on uh, yes. times might change as appropriate uh, but we will try but we will try our best to be consistent and uh, on time also. So then you more can less, join us. Yeah. Uh, usually the time is, yes, usually the time is from 10 my time uh, and uh, still will share more details well, about the time. Well, that's 10 mountain time, much, which, I guess. which is right now. 10 it's, mountain it's time. One o'clock Eastern time, yeah. Okay. So 10 mountain time and uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time will be more or less, we'll be here. And no, it's one o'clock, one o'clock Eastern, we not 10 o'clock. Yes. Okay, one o'clock Eastern time. Yeah. And uh, what we were doing before, uh, we read, uh, we do the capital R reading of Miyamura Musashi's oh. book of Five Ring. And that was yeah, a wonderful experience yeah, yeah. because it gives a lot of understanding uh, about the how the writers, especially uh, writers in history, how they were writing things to understand from the context and to try to understand, of course, and from their point of view, from their perspectives, what resources available at that time, how they were communicating, how the communication style was at that time, and it's still how much they were trying to share. You, you can see that earnestness, uh, of wow. course, not available to everyone, but uh, uh, I, I really wow. truly respect all the writers in the history especially because they had very limited resources. Yes, some were into ego also that, oh yes, I'm sharing and I'm telling and I'm going to reveal the truth. But still, it's valuable because uh, they, those are the people, those were the people who were laying the foundation for this awareness now. So our present decisions are the bedrock of future circumstances. This is what they have been doing. They were choosing to share. And this is what the power of sharing is. And right now we are enjoying all this, the benefits of works of uh, the awareness. They have been laying foundation. Doesn't mean that, that they were giving us accurately, precisely everything, what we are adjusting, editing, uh, improving, and updating a lot of ideas and perspectives. I'm trying to share it to group, but it's not it's from, not letting me share uh, it to group for some reason. And lost it, it doesn't negate it from other people. Say again, Bini, you're a little soft. Oh, sorry, say it again, sir. Yeah, oh, I'm just saying okay. you're a little so soft. So I was just saying so. that, okay, yes, a lot of... Uh, update. Okay, so now? Yeah, it's better, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. So I was just saying that, yes, a lot of people nowadays, new writers, new philosophers, thinkers, um, and of course, influencers also, uh, not in, in uh, social media terms, but influencer in real way, they are updating a lot of perspectives and sharing new perspective, new ideas, but it doesn't negate the value of the what we had uh, already uh, from the older times. Those books, those uh, sharings, really they put the foundation of what we are doing now and of course uh, this is what life is all about growing and learning and updating and uh, they laid the foundation 
and on that foundation we are building a new yes. thing and of course yes. new, in future people new people will come and they will update also yeah so this is the process and this is the beauty of learning and growing yes. always in uh, in yes, updating yes, yes. mood always always and this is really really beneficial so uh, why i was just hearing all these things because there is a there is a context that why i was sharing all these things because what we are going to do now it's a different project there of course it is capital oh. r reading but it is more than capital r reading for me uh from now on we are going to share something uh very interesting for me because people uh who i met online and uh, mostly i don't like to call them teachers and they also don't like but uh, my friends who were comparatively of course uh, more than me they were aware and uh, they were on their path or journey really really far ahead of me they all were in some or the other way coding that person who's writing we are going to uh, start reading from today and that was i was aware of this name so this name was coming from different directions to me i take these type of things as as signs from universe because if if you feel connected to someone like ray bradbury like uh, if i'm pronouncing her name right ursula king i i really uh, uh, like some of her quotes really impact my life in many ways and in some other people and this today's writer what we are going to do uh, start reading from today this is also one of them i don't know about him but that name was keep coming back to me i don't consider them i, I don't uh, uh, perceive them any writer as just a, just a writer or just a writing for me these are people we are living people for me if i am able to read about them if i'm able to read their writings in some other way, other way or if i'm uh, able to hear about them in detail for me these are real people right now they are available wow, wow, and they wow. are connected with me wow i i feel privileged that i have this thing in my life and this this perspective gives me a lot of value because these people are part of me now and that what a wonderful thing to have such yeah. wonderful people in your life and today what we are going to a new journey it's a new journey for me to start learning because the intent is different before the capital r reading was to to be familiar with to know what they are saying how they are saying and the intent and all these things which is of course the, these are the components of capital r reading but i'm adding a bit more into this wow of course i'm going to do it. i have an intent to receive it completely and fully to maximize my receiving my receptivity so i can actually understand and not only understand but i can make it my own well wow. so this is my intent for this reading so thank you so much sir for giving me this low long 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 time for <laughs> sharing all my my thoughts about this these were my thoughts of the day and please share what we are going to do from now well wow. well wow. all right so what we're going to be doing now is we are going to be reading the Carlos Castaneda book series. And they're 14 books altogether. Right? So it's quite a lot. We might not do one of them because it's about practical physical exercises. Uh, so we'll, we might skip that one. There's still 13 books we're going to be reading. It's a, it's a long series that has much, much, much value in it. However, I do have to stress the value needs to be extracted, right? Yes. There's a lot in this, and it touches on all sorts of different things, right? And the language he also uses, you have to be very, very discerning, right? If you're not discerning, you're going to easily get the wrong image and the wrong impression from this book, right? Now, 
uh, these books, this series. This is a very influential series, but it's not influential uh, where in the mainstream many people know that it's influential, right? It has a deep mm. effect. Yeah. yeah, it is influential in some categories, in some areas, but it's it's been influential where it's misunderstood. The profoundness here is immense, but it's also very, very easily misperceived. And if you don't apply discernment, you're going to get the wrong idea. And to me, there's a magic to this book series in this fact that it's it creates this impression, not intentionally, but if you're not paying attention, you get the wrong idea. And it's like it almost tests you to see if you are going to be discerning and if you are going to extract the real value. You know, when these books, when I started reading them, I started reading these in the early 80s, right? It was the culmination of my great big reading project in which I read all the classics in chronological order. And I'd asked different people to give me suggestions. And this one fellow gave me these and he said, you must read them in order. He really emphasized it. And he emphasized it like a lot of times. It's very important. You must read them in order. And, and that was anomalous to me. And it stuck with me. So uh, as I went through the great reading project, you know, I started way back with the earliest writings found, like with the Rig Vedas that was at the time in the classics. Anyway. And then going through all the centuries, you know, reading uh, in, in his old Sanskrit writings, Chinese, and of course the Greeks and the Romans, and going through the entire world, right? And just do Western. I, I wanted the world. There was obviously less uh, available then. But anyway, so as I got through this and as I'm going through the ages, I'm finding very little value and I was getting really despondent, especially when starting reading all the, the negative stuff of like the 1700s and the 1800s, you know, Balzac and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, etc. Oh my goodness. It's just really just very depressing stuff. And, and there's no real value. Yes, you get a bit of an insight into human negativity, you know, like, all right, so what? You know, it doesn't really benefit me. It tells me what not to be. It doesn't tell me what to be. There's very little value. So I, I started to develop a really powerful intent of what I wanted. I said, I want something that has good language because I liked a lot of the Buddhist stuff. There's a tons of value. You know, the Buddhist, Buddhist uh, canon, as it's called, right? All the texts that support Buddhism, all the different sects of Buddhism. Uh, the, it's huge. It's massive. I don't think many people have an idea of how huge it is. Right? It's really, really big. Uh, tons of writing on it. And, and when you dig through it, and you know what people have done and pull all tons of value, but the language is from back in the day, way back when. It doesn't resonate. It doesn't connect. And that was really uh, unfortunate because there was so much value in the Buddhist stuff, but it was hard to use it because the language wasn't there. Now, this is before I kind of developed my own language, but well, at least I had started to, but I hadn't even realized then yet. I was too modest. I didn't realize that I'd not only developed my own language, but my own philosophy. But nonetheless, this helped me to get there. So I had this intent for value, uh, usable, practical, applicable value, right? And, and also uh, something that had the depth to it, co cohesion. And, 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 and completeness, and also uh, somewhat exotic. I don't know why I put that in there, but anyway, that was put in there. Just a bit more exciting. And so I really set this intent. And as I kept reading, you know, I, I, well, I, just because I'm thorough, I'm going to complete my list, even though I wasn't very optimistic, because there's nothing very exciting on the list at all. Anyway, I completed my list, and right at the very end of the list is Carlos Castaneda. Right? And reading this was fantastic because it was everything I had intended. Tons of value, good language, very exotic, uh, kind of wild and exciting. It was really interesting stuff. It was fascinating, but also very valuable. And you had to pull it out. You had to extract it. Now, I had started my project to take notes, and I would write it in a big, big hardcover notebook, uh, fa fabulous notebooks. 
And I, I, had, I had done very little throughout the centuries. But when I got to Carlos, boy, my, my red pen was underlining tons and tons of stuff, right? That's very important. Now, so this, there's a lot of depth here. Of course, you need to use the depth and you need to make it your own. In Don Juan's words, a warrior has to take what he's shown and make it his own, right? Very, very key. There's no, this is Don Juan's. No, it's not Don Juan's. Don Juan is a communicator of information that comes from a lineage that he's part of. Yes, who knows? Some of it he may have added or did add, you know, because you keep extending. The lineage is a progression. It evolves. It, it moves on. Uh, some may come from, you know, his predecessor or one before him or how far back. We don't know. Who? It doesn't matter. Don Juan will tell you it doesn't matter who said it and where it comes from. It's totally irrelevant. What matters is whether you get it, you use it, and whether you're going to make it your own. Right? This is part of Wave Impeccability too, the program, which uses much of this and takes it further, much further. Right? Very, very, very critical because also I have, before I came to Don Juan, I had developed not only motivation psychology, but learning psychology, right? Because I'm very keen on learning myself, right? Very, 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 uh, all that's what I've been doing all my life since age 10. So I really paid attention to what works when it comes to learning, what matters when it comes to learning, how we do learn and not just learn in the normal sense, learn for actual change. Because learning in the normal sense is just adding stuff to your hard drive. It's just filling up your database. It, it doesn't change you. It doesn't actually change you as, as a, in your abilities and, your, and your, your tools that you have available, right? So that to me is more important. Not necessarily learning uh, how to use the tool, but learning about tools and learning how to create tools. Now you really have learned how to learn, right? Very, very powerful. So all of this goes in here. And, and I want to really add also that Carlos, if you mention Carlos to people who know about it, oh, you're all about the drugs. The current Ayurveda big deal thing, it, it, it got a major impetus with Carlos. Now, it wasn't Ayurveda at the time, it was peyote. Peyote used to be the Ayurveda, and then it kind of faded, and well, now it's Ayurveda, but it used to be peyote at one time, right? And, 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 and the point of it was, we, we, at least in the hippie movement, you know, we, we think sex and drugs and rock and rolls, that was all about the hippies. Yes, there was a lot of drugs, but most people think it's recreational, was the idea. No. The, 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 the pursuit of drugs was for spiritual reasons. To, to expand your consciousness, enlarge your mind, et cetera, et cetera. Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor who popularized LSD, right? That was his logic too. That was why he, he said it was a cool thing and he, he made it very popular because he was personal improvement, expanding your consciousness, et cetera. Not for fun and recreation, right? That was never the intent. And this is a mainstream media perception you know the war on drugs and all this that has given this negative twist to it right now peyote uh, because because it is tied to native american um you know traditions etc it, it it there's church there's the church of peyote where you can go you can join the church belong to the church part of your religion and you can legally take peyote right <laughs> So it's pretty interesting that there's a lot of extra depth to all of this. Now, before we start reading, and, and this is what Vina was saying about background, I put the cover of the first book here. <laughs> Just because this came out in, I forget now, either 67 or 68, and I think sometimes it's, it's shown both ways because there were many different covers. But in 1973, after the publication of the third book, Journey to Ixtlan, Carlos Castaneda was on the cover of Time magazine. Now, maybe today it's not such a big deal anymore because we have got the internet and everything. But in pre-internet era back then, Time magazine was the magazine. It was a big deal. To be on the cover was a major deal. And they only put people on the cover who were making a profound 
a difference and influence in culture, right? That that they were they were they mattered in some way, right? So this recognition by time was quite significant, and this is how big a deal Carlos was, right? Now Carlos is also extremely controversial. When I came to read it, there were books out there. One guy in particular, Richard the Mill, and debunkers because Carlos was saying that. Don Juan is somebody he knew and he's a real person. But when you read, Don Juan is really something else. And people didn't want to believe that Don Juan could be real. Right? So they said, no, it's all nonsense. But you know what fascinated me when I read, I said, what does it matter whether Don Juan is actually real or not? What matters is whether what he's saying is valuable. I watch a movie and I know it's sucked out of some writer's thumb but the character in the movie might say something that oh yeah well that's kind of cool you know that's valuable that makes me think right if it's valuable that's what matters and you know for the life of me this was so fascinating i could not get how these you know professors and all this how they got so bent out of shape about whether or not this was true and real or not now this first book is also carlos's uh, a doctoral thesis uh, as or at least he, not doctoral but his thesis to be an anthropologist sorry not for his doctorate for his just his regular degree so he submitted this right these notes of his and his field study as an anthropologist so this was officially presented to the university right and it was all part of that and then he had his guys the professors that he worked with and studying under and they made comments and there's a you know quote from one of them in the book so this made because it was coming through academia it was very controversial because it was also uh, from an anthropological point of view the you supposed to go and study uh, the people but stay out of their system you're not supposed to get immersed and become a part of the system, which is what Carlos did. So it was very controversial from that point of view too, because from that intellectual academic point of view, yes, you're losing your objectivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of controversy. And this is absolutely fascinating because when we now zoom out and we look at things from a tunement point of view, yes, I always was fascinated how this book was so uncategorizable, even to the extent that uh, up until probably past 2000, right? Uh, these books, when you went to a library or a bookshop, you'd find one under anthropology, one under Native American studies, under self-improvement, under, I don't know, um, 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 uh, like uh, psychedelics, all sorts of different stuff, right? I mean, there were like a dozen different categories that the philosophy, you name it, boy, it was all over the show. It was just nobody knew what to do with it. I don't even know where they put it today. But this fact that it was so uncategorizable, this was profound to me because it was to me a message from the universe saying, you need to determine. Don't rely on other people. Don't rely on what they say. You need to determine and you need to extract value right this is absolutely crucial now in this reading there's more to this that we're going to be doing we aren't only going to be doing the reading but we're also going to be doing extracting yes and for that i'll do what i did back then when i first when computers were still new early 80s right personal computers were new 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 and you got them and it was a blank screen just black with the flashing little cursor and you had to basically program your own computer. Then as it went along, there was software. So uh, by the time I was doing this, I, I was able to, the first spreadsheets had just come out. Lotus 1, 2, 3, changed the world, really. It was an incredible program, really, really made a big difference. Huh? <laughs> you can probably go and look it up somewhere on the, the influence of spreadsheets. Today, we think, you know, spreadsheets, you take it for granted. Uh, and it's, it's like a byword for analyzing and, and stuff. But back then, it was a new thing. Anyway, so I pulled out these quotes and I put them into the spreadsheet. 
because I wanted to tag them with categories. Now, back then, tagging, nobody ever heard of tagging, right? I mean, to me, I, maybe people that did it, but I'd never heard of it. It was a new thing to me. And now, of course, we don't think twice about it. Everything is tagged. But I put uh, pulled these quotes and then put it into a word processing file. I put it into a spreadsheet so that I could tag it in a separate column. And then I could sort by column. And then I would be able to rearrange the content according to the different categories of information. And they are very profound categories here, right? As you will see, as we go through. Now we're going to later on, when we're done with this, however long this is going to take, we're going to do the same capital R reading with the Biala series and pulling the quotes and tagging them and categorizing them. You'll see, you'll see how it works in this. Now, I again want to emphasize You've got to read with perception and discernment and read for value and not get pulled in by the popularity. Keep in mind, this book came out in 67, 68 at the height of the hippie era. Yes. And these books over time change and, and you know, the emphasis changes of what's important. Uh, later on, Don Juan says, yes, you know, the power plants, as he calls it, the, the drugs, in other words, they were important because you were an idiot and you were just so stuck. And we were trying to get you, shake you loose from your stuckness, right? From his bubble of perception, in other words. I'm going to use a lot of my language, like bubble of perception, not Don Juan's language. Yeah. And uh, I really feel as we go through, you'll get to know Don Juan. Don Juan is going to very much approve of this. Because Don Juan uses language very well, right? But he's also very open to improvement and shifting and moving. And he, and he says, you know, a lot of his language is an Indian. It comes from his Indian understanding too. But he, he's a bit overly modest too. He's also the most sophisticated character in any book I've ever encountered. Let me repeat that. Don Juan is the most sophisticated character in any book I've ever encountered. By far, by far, yes. I mean, not no one even close. Yes, his compatriots, his companions. We don't hear too much of them, with one exception, Don Gennaro, uh, also extremely sophisticated, right? Uh, this is something really, really, really exceptional as a character. And if you get past this idea or don't even pay attention to it, as a character we don't care whether don juan is real or not it's irrelevant to us where is, is is real or true makes no difference it's not an issue what he says is the most sophisticated content that you can find outside of biela <laughs> biela may be a touch more sophisticated yeah, possible anyway but on that same in that same field it's not about more or less i'm simply making the point that we want to pay attention to the sophistication involved, the depth, the value, the usefulness. Now, in book one, of all the books, this has the least amount of quotes that you can pull from it. But they were enough to hook me to get me to read more. Right, And you'll see why. They were so potent in just that little bit. The few of them that there were, they were just, they, they revealed a moreness. They said, wow, here's more. And it got me to read. I had no idea what was going to come in book two and book three. And in books two and three, Carlos goes back over his notes and he realizes he missed the boat. That he, 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 book one was an emphasis that was inappropriate. And, and he starts to realize the depth of what's coming his way from Don Juan. Any questions, Mina? Any questions? Okay. Uh, not a question, but no I... Comments? This is something... Yes, yes. <laughs> and also, also there is something I request to explain it more because uh, this is something I have been uh, thinking about because many people were uh, like they, they, they have, they were raising eyebrows that, oh, this is not yours. This is coming from someone else because they have read the code or uh, they heard about it. They read the book or something like that. And uh, because my, my, initial basic or the primary uh, understanding of things coming from way of impeccability. So for me, it's like, so what? So I was oh. not, but, but when you take things so uh, because this is the first perspective you got and it is so innate to you. So
sometimes I lost. I lost you. They say again the last sentence. Have an explanation for that. Yes. For me, it is like the yes. So what if it is coming from someone else? How? 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 Exactly. Exactly. It's the value that counts. It's not so, about okay. memorizing what somebody else says. If you memorize, you're wasting your time. You have to make it your own. Uh, someone else and not. Say that again. Yes. So um, th this is this is a problem. So please. Okay. I was saying that sometimes when things in perspective uh, are so innate to you or you are sometimes, okay, in my case, you only know that perspective. Of course, it can be updated, but uh, when you only know the one perspective that, oh, things are valuable and the value is important, yeah. not uh, necessarily we're coming from where or there. Uh, but uh, because it was so dull for me, so I was not able to communicate it properly and appropriately, that yeah. why it is valuable, why it is not a crime, not a, a copyright violation or anything like that virtually to use someone else's thing. And that is something yeah. I want you to please explain it a bit in detail because we need something. Because I have seen many people when they read or, or hear about way of impeccability and concept of moreness and perspectives, and they want to use it, but they kind of feel guilty of. Yeah, I know. Like, shy yeah, away yeah. from it yeah, completely. Yeah. They, they, they don't get, they don't do right. in, uh, uh, they don't communicate. Because they want to share it, but of course they don't want to uh, yeah. uh, share that, that, oh, it is coming from someone else. Because yeah. they assume that it is going to be a some sort of like, okay, permission needed and all sort of things. And, uh, and there's a guilt. My concern is not that they are using it or not. My concern yeah. is people when they have guilt. It's a, it's a kind of a guilt they have that, okay, because, because I'm going to quote something like that, so I need to change it. Then I need to uh, not communicate with them because uh, I'm using their perspectives, which is not uh, our part of thinking. So please no, explain it. No, in no. More For one thing, right? Uh, yes. Don Juan would be he'd, he'd laugh at this idea of of what he's sharing belonging to him. He'd hmm. laugh at this. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he just laugh at it. He say, you know, this is it's knowledge. You can't own a knowledge. It's, it's just ludicrous, right? Uh, beside which, you say, you can copy and quote all my things in your head all you like, or right, and that's not going to change you. It's the same yes. thing. You download stuff onto your hard drive. Does it change your operating system? No. When you download an update to your operating system or any program, what happens? You download the update file, and then what do you have to do? You have to install it. Hmm. Same thing here. You can download all this information all you like, unless you install it. Not going to make any difference. What is installing? Installing is making it your own. It's a very big part of way of impeccability, right? The program that I put together, which is a life change and a self change program, which uses very sophisticated, extremely sophisticated learning tools. Tools for real and lasting change. Okay. This is one of them, making it your own, which is the repeat backs and the takeaways. See? And that's part of it. And then changing your self conception. There's a whole lot in, in way of impeccability. It all deals with this. But the core is to make it your own. Therefore, the quote doesn't matter because you need to put it in your own words. If your own words happen to go inside, so be it. But your own words. Now you're making this your own. You're feeling it. Once it's your own, it doesn't matter where it originated. It's your own. Even if you're using the same words, if you make it your own, it's yours, not anybody else's. Because knowledge cannot be owned by anybody. Copyright is a different thing to say, okay, you said it first. And you can pull legally. You can pull things from it up to a certain amount and all this. No, no, it was, it was virtual copyright I was talking about. Yeah. But like it's I'm more, saying that it's people as you. Right. But this is only if you're going to be republishing it or whatever, right? Not utilizing it for your own self. So you know, it's it's a non-issue. The point is you got to extract the value, make it your own. That's the key, right? If you don't, mm -hmm. you're wasting your time. And that's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to really pull the value out of it. Now, I've already done this, yes? 
Um, but and and I went taking it much further. I mean, you know, I mean, by the time I created Wave Impeccability, it was a long time since I looked at Carlos or Don Juan, right? And because mm. I've been living my own life based on my own philosophy created, which when I was reading Don Juan, I didn't even realize it at the time. The resonance came because I'd already created my own and much was overlapping and resonating, right? And and I was, I was because I was so modest, I never even thought that I had done this. But over time, then I started to really realize, wow, you know what? I, I really put together a, a comprehension here and a depth that goes that has much to it and goes further than Don Juan. And it comes at things from a different angle, right? Because Don Juan has a lineage, but the lineage also has baggage to it, which he's going to tell you, right? And we're going to get this, this baggage that Don Juan has in his lineage is very important. Right? And the lineage essentially ends, as far as we know, kind of with Carlos, right? We don't know if it's carrying on, but it seems to be because something happens with Carlos. Carlos takes this and he puts it out into the world which changes, you know, before this was private knowledge communicated from teacher to student and down the lineage, right? And so this, or, or there were multiple students, groups really, but still it, it's passed on down the line, right? It wasn't available to everybody, but Carlos publishing it with Don Juan's permission, it changes the whole logic. Now there are many things that aren't available to us, but there's enough that is available and it's changing the nature of learning, growth, personal change and the pursuit of freedom. And what I call independence of being, the pursuit of independence of being. This is a start. It's a change. It's a paradigm shift. There's so much we're going to be touching on. So, so much. So let's get going, Abina. Let's read, at least read the introduction, right? Okay. Uh, that, that puts this in, you know, Carlos's introduction. Uh, you'll see what I mean. I just want to check and see real quick in case we have any comments from anybody. Uh, Norma's here. I'll return later. Jessica says, I started not to feel guilt for not sharing the same perspective as someone else. I started sticking with my own knowledge and now I see something based on facts. Absolutely. This is the key. You, you know, this whole point of, of feeling guilt about not having opinions that are others. Where does this come from? This comes from the feudal system of control. You know, we've got peasants, which are, are voluntary slaves, really. And the, the idea is control. You don't want to, so you push this idea, or oh, you've got to conform. You've got to have the same opinions. If you don't, then you're bad and wrong, and it's sinful and all this stuff. Right? So yes, Jessica, very key. Nice that you're here, Jessica. Wonderful. Uh, Jessica yes. also says, I have learned that sometimes my own perspective is based on how I am feeling at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our feelings can change our perception of the world. Yeah. So we have to be very yes. careful to really say, is what I am perceiving based on my feelings or is it actually so? Yeah, very, very cautious of this, right? We, we tend to believe things because we feel a certain way and we perceive it and now it's very strong and we take it as a truth. No, it's not a truth. It's a distortion based on your feelings at the time, right? So we have to learn to be objective. It's a powerful skill. And that's part of way of impeccability, yes? part of that mm. all right so let's go and start to read and let me get the chapter up here and then we'll read uh, very exciting very exciting all oh, carlos books yeah so by the way in this uh, somebody it seemed to me they typed this out they didn't do a, a scan because there's some typos and stuff in here not many, but you're not uh, sharing a screen, sir. So please, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. It's just a bit slow to share. All right, here we go. And they changed the updated Zoom before I could just go and you know share, enter, enter, and I was there. But now it's like you have to click, you can't just hit enter. All right, there we go. We're all set, we're all ready, right? And I can see the comments on the side there. Very good, wonderful, Jessica. Now, this is a long thing that we're going to be undertaking, yes? And, uh, you know, I'll remind as we go through, I'll remind about the important points that we have to be discerning. You have to look past things, right? And for instance, we're going to see in this first book, keep in mind, right? This was his thesis that he's putting in for his degree as an anthropologist. 
it's in that intellectual context of anthropology that this is coming but things change things change right <laughs> carlos gets thrown a lot of curveballs all right so yeah first of all let's start with the title carlos castaneda the, the author here the teachings of don juan a yucky way of knowledge right this was <laughs> very popular this was very popular this was a big deal this was Oh, the teachings of Don Juan. First of all, there are very few teachings in here. Secondly, it's not got anything to do with yucky. Don Juan is a yucky, but it's not a yucky way of knowledge. No. It's a Toltec way of knowledge, but that even that's not accurate. It's a Don Juan lineage, at least. I don't know. He doesn't have a name for the lineage. It's his lineage which originated in the Toltecs. It's their way of knowledge, right? It's a very specific thing. So Carlos gets this wrong. He just assumes, assumes that because Don Juan is a yucky, what he's showing him is yucky knowledge. Some of it may be, yes, but the whole totality, absolutely not, right? Not even close. But this is just that arrogance, that intellectual arrogance, of assumption, right? It's it's right there in the title. It's quite profound. It's quite profound, right? Now the teachings part, yes, but but again, you're going to see the teachings, the actual teachings in the first book, very little, but still, it was a very powerful title. Because there was nothing out there like it, right? And when I came across it, I'm like, oh, righty then, yeah, cool. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. And, you know, yucky way of knowledge. Oh, it was very exotic and exciting, you know, Native American stuff. It was a big deal. Today, it's like, yeah, it sort of lost that, that allure and appeal that it had back then. It was seen as something very exciting and very mystical and mournous. And uh, right. it didn't quite live up to that hype, of course, but still. And so right in the title, we see some very profoundness that needs to be taken into cognizance, right? So this Yaki way of knowledge, no, right? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of giving a bit of a spoiler here because it's important because otherwise you get stuck in these bubbles and you get pulled into these bubbles and it, and it can defeat the object. And we have to basically get through book one. Let me repeat that. We have to get through book one. The magic starts in book two and book three. Really, really profound stuff, right? The value, the usable stuff. And then after that, it gets, there is more, but it gets into all sorts of paths, explorations of alternatives. And very magical, very cool. But nonetheless, right? We have to get through book one. You'll see why. All right. So <laughs> keep in mind, this is all Carlos in his intellectual bubble. Would you like to read, please, Pina? Oh, I'll try. I do have a problem, but I... Is it big enough? Can you can you read? No, no, no. It's not about big or, or small. It is just... Uh, anyway, I'm going to... <laughs> okay. Introduction. In the summer of 1960, while I was an anthropology student at the University of California, Los Angeles, I made several trips to the Southwest to collect information on the medical plants, medicinal plants, used by the Indians of the area. The events I described here began during one of my trips. All right, so let's just, let's just pause there, right? <laughs> Look at the yes. language. Back then, it was still Indians, right? I mean, I know a lot of Native Americans, they call themselves Indians still, right? So mm -hmm. don't, don't get too hung up on this that it's a negative, right? Uh, and Don Juan calls himself an Indian, right? And that was just the term at the time, right? I mean, it changed because people got all bent out of shape as Native American now or whatever, or, you know, first peoples like in Canada, right? Well, stuff like that. But still, uh, that was, and, and medicinal plants, right? This was yes. Carlos's focus, medicinal plants, okay? Mm. His, his, his anthropological focus, medicinal plants used by the Indians or Native Americans. All right, please keep going, Bina. The events I describe here began during one of my trips. I was waiting in border town of Greyhound bus for a Greyhound bus, talking with a friend who had been my guide and helper. In the survey... Yeah, sorry, uh, Bina, 
just whoever whoever wrote this or typed this for some reason the 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 you know it, it jumps like this right so you just have to sort of pay attention right it's making okay. a break for whatever reason i don't know why you know it shouldn't be that way it's not originally okay. like that it's just the way the person formatted this uh okay. it, it messed okay. it up right uh, by the way be i've like been to and... i've been to this particular greyhound station oh wow yeah it's in nogales yeah i've been there <laughs> Oh, very but cool. I was place. waiting in a border town for a greyhound bus, talking with a friend who had been my guide and helper in the circuit. Suddenly, he leaned towards me and whispered that the man, a white-haired old Indian, who was sitting in front of the window, was very learned about plants, especially peyote. Learned, yeah, learned about plants. Learned about plants, especially peyote. I asked my friend to introduce me to his, this man. Peyote. Now, uh, keep in mind, right? This is coming out in 67, 68. Peyote mm -hmm. and, and drugs, this was like, ooh, like it was, it had a very big who factor. Huge, mm -hmm. right? People had heard about it and knew it was something really exotic and wild and didn't have much experience. But it was like, like a, 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 the ultimate almost, yes, in mm -hmm. terms of drugs right it was like the biggest big deal that you could do right so this was a very big deal right i mean the the mystique of peyote was huge then you know ayurveda has a lot of mystique and magic to it now but it's 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 so reduced compared to back then right because there's so much that we have access to now everything is diluted right everything is diluted you have to really really take the internet and say, okay, shut off the entire internet and look at what is available to you. Now you say, wow, okay, I'm getting my information maybe through the movies, through books, through the newspapers, magazines, and word of mouth. Yeah. And yeah. of course, all of those, their, their relative importance is massively magnif magnified. Yeah. Because they this, it's not competing with your phone and with the internet and with your computer and everything all the time, right? It is it has much more potency to it. So everything today is diluted. Yeah, unless you're in that bubble and in that click, then they get a bit more magnified, right? But back then, you know, uh, things that got prominence, like of course in the news, you'd be hearing about the hippies and the trouble and the Vietnam War and all of this stuff, right? And this was a big deal. And of course, you know, drugs, especially to the whole world, this was something that was just not part of anybody's reality. It wasn't, I mean, yes, of course, drugs have been around forever, but in your average day-to-day -day person, well, they drank alcohol and that was it. Drugs was a new thing. It was new. And because it was such a big deal and a big deal was made of it, it kind of took over people's brains. <laughs> And you still see there is residue of that even today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very powerful stuff. Anyway, so this point about peyote, right? Because yes. now, right, Carlos said he was interested in medicinal plants. Peyote is not a medicinal plant necessarily. It's a spiritual, hmm. right? I mean, it's a cactus, but, you know, its usage is for spiritual reasons. And well, you could say medicinal because as Don Juan will say, you know, peyote is different to other things because it teaches you the right way to live, kind of. Yeah? So a very different logic here. Right? So it's, it's a whole different deal. But now, you know, his friend is emphasizing peyote, which is not medicinal. But the fact that it's emphasized tells you something, right? See what I mean, Venus? Yes. Yes, uh, yes. We have to pay attention. Yes. We have to really, really. Yes, pay because attention. this is also showing me this the how receptive he was. Because yeah. uh, when people are open and they are receptive towards something, the uh, universe brings you more. He was focused to get something about medicinal plants. Yeah. But now he's getting more and more and more other things also. Right, so right. So, right. Receptivity but, right, but, there. right. And, but you see, also, we, you, if we pay attention from an attunement point of view, we are going to see attunement 
represented here profoundly. Yes, this is an oh. emphasis that is anomalous by his friend. Yeah, and yes. and it's 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 setting the tone for what's to come. Carlos is yes. unaware of this, completely unaware. Right, he's just writing. Yes. He's at this stage. Carlos is still completely in a bubble. He's still that that intellectual university guy. Right, he doesn't know nothing yet. Right, and you'll see even at the end of the book. Right, you'll see how he's still in that bubble. But this is the universe pointing it out to him, right? And that especially peyote from his friend, who's kind of cool in Carlos's sort of mind, but also a little bit out there, and you know, uh, but it 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 grabs his interest. It grabs his interest. It's fascinating how Carlos gets ensnared by the universe. Pay attention to this. It's fascinating. All right, keep going, please, Bina. <laughs> My friend greeted him, then went over and shook his hand. After they had talked for a while, my friend signaled me to join them, but immediately left me alone with the old man, not even bothering to introduce us. Look at this he too. The... Look, at, look at the anomaly yes. here, right? Yes. Right. I mean, uh, it's like, wow. Wow. He, he just dumps Carlos on Don Juan, right? And and for yes. Don Juan, this is significant, as we'll see later. But that's I I I I'm I'm, I'm you know, we're doing a capital R reading here, and these nuanced points are very important, because for Don Juan, everything is about attunement. Now he doesn't use the word attunement. This is my word, but I I I am absolutely one hundred percent positive that this is a word that if Don Juan hears it, he would use it because it describes what he is doing in a much better way than he describes it. You'll see, you'll see. So attunement is absolutely crucial to Don Juan. And I, I, I have to emphasize this because it, it changes how we understand what's going on. I know I'm bringing things ahead of time, but it adds to our ability to process value, which is why I'm doing it. All right, please. All right, look at the next line, very key. Yes. He was not in the least embarrassed. He I was not him. in the least embarrassed. Right there, right there, we get to understand that Don Juan is not typical. Right? Mm -hmm. And that Don Juan has independence of being. Because embarrassment yes. comes from lack of independence of being. Lack of impeccability. Okay? Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. I told him my name and he said that he was called Juan. Yeah. And yeah. that he was at my service. He used the Spanish polite form of address. He shook hands. We shook hands at my initiative and then remained silent for some time. It was not a strange silence, but a quietness, natural and relaxed on both sides. Again. Anomalous, again attunement, again important. Yes. Very important for Don Juan. The 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 symbolicness of this is very very important. We're going to see later on. By the way, for many years yeah. I it called him Juan. Yes. Yeah, because yes. I I've I've never heard, heard this. Yes, if I, would right? I mean, this, this is you, way back in South Africa. Nobody speaks Spanish there. Or in America, you know, this is common. You know how it's pronounced. But back then, and I, I, I was in my own bubble and nobody to discuss it with. And so it was Don Juan. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know because you're in a bubble, you know. It's just amazing. All right. But this, this, this. This relaxedness, right? But the quiet, it was not a strained silence, but a quietness, natural and relaxed on both sides. Again, not embarrassed, relaxed and at ease. Tells you a lot about yes. Don Juan. All right, please yes. keep going. Though his dark face and neck were wrinkled, showing his age, it struck me that his body was agile and muscular. I then told him that I was interested in obtaining information about medicinal plants, although in truth, I was almost totally ignorant about POT. I found myself pretending that I knew a great deal <laughs> and even suggesting that it might be T 
to his advantage to talk with me. Now look wow. at that sentence, right? Now look at that yes. sentence and what it tells us about Carlos. Yes. His insecurity, his idea, his belief that people will only get into something with you, right? Involve with you and share with you if there's something in it for him. In other words, Carlos has a contractual mindset. So he's saying, well, you know, there's some advantage if you get involved with me. It's just bullshit, in other words, BS, right? But this is very important to understand this about Carlos, where he comes from, and, and the culture and the world that he believes that this is appropriate, right? And, and that insecurity of his makes him feel that he needs to pretend he's more than he actually is, right? So very revealing here, very revealing here, right? But I, but this is again we're going to see how attunement how attunement is everything in this whole entire reading everything every single page every single interaction is all about attunement everything right I have to emphasize this it's huge right so look at this you're going to see right now how this this idiocy of Carlos is so profound profoundly significant and how the universe is leveraging things to hook Carlos. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. powerful. All right. But this is this is also very interesting uh, because as Carlos right now, I have no idea that okay how these things uh, how things will turn up uh, in future uh, with both of them, like their relation, their interaction. But right now, I think that that this this uh, subtle not subtle but uh, a bit of stupidity naivety of okay, not yeah, stupidity yeah. was yeah. so so remarkable and beneficial for him because oh, yeah. otherwise he would not be in touch with so sometimes uh, yeah. you yeah. need to when you see that moreness uh, I don't know about him yeah. but I am saying about personally for myself when you see that people have moreness and value and you want that don't don't think about that who you are right now because it, it, it is irrelevant what you want to be yeah so focus on that instead of because otherwise uh you will never be able to because i would never be able to to communicate any of my friends because they were so far far ahead yeah like yeah. i was not not from their league in any way so I would not be, but this is something what I want in life. So you have to get out of your comfort zone and, and put yourself in a situation, maybe a bit exaggeration in your self-trust and confidence that, okay, I can. So oh. Sometimes, as, as why things coming via attunement, believe is, is something uh, mostly people use positively in this regard. Otherwise, we would not be like, okay, you would shy away and say, no, I don't want to do this or something. No. But exactly. <laughs> it's significant. It's significant. You're going to see now in a moment. You're going to see now in a yes, moment. Yes, okay. As I, this is, okay, this is the word. Yes. As I rattled on, he nodded slowly and looked at me, but said nothing. I avoided, I avoided his eyes and we finished by standing, the two of us in dead silence. Finally, after what seemed a very long time, Don Juan got up and looked out of the window. Bus had come. He said goodbye and left the station. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was annoyed at having talked nonsense to him and at being seen through by those remarkable eyes. Right there. Wow. And at wow. being seen through by those remarkable eyes. Now, if we study the superiority paradigm and the psychology of the superiority paradigm, we understand that vehemence, narcissists, this is the one thing they cannot stand. They cannot stand having been seen through. And they will make every effort to write this imbalance, this collapse. Right, this re revealing of their nonsense, this exposure, they will make every effort to try and correct it. Yeah, we're going to see this from Carlos. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I was annoyed 
at having talked nonsense to him and being and at being seen through by those remarkable eyes. When my friend returned, he tried to console me for my failure to learn anything from Don Juan. He explained that the old man was often silent or non-committal. But the disturbing effect of this first encounter was not so easily dispelled. I made a point of finding out where Don Juan lived and later visited him several times. On each visit, I tried to lead him to discuss Piotr, but without success. We became nonetheless very good friends and my scientific investigation was forgotten or was at least uh, redirected into channels that were worlds apart from my original intention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting, right? That even though peyote was emphasized and Carlos is very excited about this whole idea of peyote and he, he tries to get uh, no luck, right? All his manipulation and wheedling and cajoling and uh, all his skills at getting things, because he's very skilled at this, right? Um, that doesn't work on Don Juan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's really cool, right? And and his intentions get forgotten here, right? We became, and my scientific investigation was forgotten or was at least redirected into channels that were worlds apart from my original intention. Yeah, so the, the point is, Carlos doesn't realize it, but he is not in charge. He's typically, he's a very good manipulator, he's a good BMN, right? But in, in the case of Don Juan, none of that works. And Don Juan is the one that's basically leading him along. But he doesn't see it yet, right? Because he's okay. got a cultural blindness. Uh, right now, blindness. right now, okay, uh, right now, uh, as you explained, because you know him, uh, but uh, as right now, but I see that a simple person who hardly or maybe never encountered uh, the mourners, this type of mourners before, would be taking things and, and uh, incidents as in a normal, casual and uh, conventional way. Like if you are meeting someone, you expect that, okay, they are going to, okay, at least because you are being introduced and somehow, you know, some, in some way, introduced by someone mutual. So the expectations was like, okay, it would be a conventional, in a conventional way that he will greet me or tell him about himself or something. But, and on top of that, his eyes. Carlos might have this, of course, and uh, other people also, but uh, he might have this understanding that he could understand the, how the Carl, uh, Don Juan was actually seeing, not on the surface, but beneath that. And this is yeah. something, of course, not easy because it might be like, okay, even um, when people are, are deliberately uh, trying to live transparent, but it's still when you have someone, uh, it makes other people uncomfortable, not necessarily because they want to hide something, but it is something that, okay, who are you? Okay, I am, but I personally feel more excited if I see someone who can actually see um, and not trying to calculate things like because I have many uh, incidents in my life and I been actually uh, uh, in, in communication with people who were trying to give me this impression. Oh, I know about you. Like they were astrologers or palmists and other uh, spiritual people. But ah. no one has that modus. Uh, which was just coming without words, without any calculation. Yeah, exactly. Any uh, I would be very excited to meet someone like this. But oh, yeah. of course, I also feel that, okay, because I have no data about Carlos right now, so I'm just giving him yeah. a neutral thing that, okay, oh, yes, yeah. his but, was like that. But your perspective is the polar opposite of Carlos's. He's excited to meet Don Juan, but not from the same perspective that you are. You, you're going to see how yeah. this works out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. The friend who had introduced me to Don Juan explained later that the old man was not a native of Arizona, where we met, uh, but was a Yaqui Indian from Sonora, Mexico. 
At first I saw Don Juan simply as a rather peculiar man who knew a great deal about Quixote and who spoke Spanish remarkably well, but the people with whom he lived believed that he had some sort of secret knowledge, that he was a brujo. A brujo, Spanish... brujo. In Spanish, the J okay. is pronounced as an H. Okay. Was a brujo. The Spanish word brujo means in English medicine man, curer, witch, sorcerer. It can... Connotes, sorry, the I connotes, I, connotes. Yes, it connotes essentially a person who has extraordinary and usually evil powers. Wow. Right. Usually, not necessarily. It's very important here, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Again, it's the common perception when we think of a witch doctor, right? The old term, right? Or medicine man. Now, the the word look, Carlos doesn't even use the word. Uh, shaman, right? He says in, mm. the word brujo in English means medicine man, curer, witch, sorcerer. Today, mm. we'd use the word shaman. This is predating the popularity of the word shaman. It's really fascinating. We think shaman, we take it so for granted. Shaman is everywhere, right? But shaman mm. in the West really, uh, it, 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 Michael Hanna popularized a term that came from I'm trying to pronounce his word right. Iliad Mercidae, I believe, right? And mm -hmm. he studied all indigenous populations. And, you know, it's, it's, it's from uh, in Russia, out in Siberia, that this was the term there and it became popularized to mean this. But also, if you go back a little bit today, uh, shaman is a very positive term, yeah? But predating mm -hmm. in this time where you've got medicine man, curer, witch, sorcerer, Look at that grouping, right? So the medicine man wasn't necessarily just a curer. He was also somebody who was had um, some kind of magical powers. And, you know, he was somebody to be feared. Mm. It's very important that the, uh, the connotation and association with medicine man, like if you go back and read maybe like H. Ryder Haggard and stuff like that, right? That, or, or you know, you know, Victorian era stuff or even earlier, right? When they first started exploring and met these different people, those medicine mans or bru brujos or whatever in, in South Africa, for instance, in the, in, in they, they call Sangomas, which right, they all, all across the world, they all have different names. But I want to make this point that they have this connotation with being evil. Why? Because people don't understand. And when they don't understand something and with ignorance unknown, they usually say what's well, bad or negative, right? Now, of course, there were some who do abuse whatever skills and knowledge they have, right? But still, uh, I just want to make this very clear that and, and why this term brujo, even today now, after Carlos and after how many ever years, right? Uh, 40 years of Carlos, more or less, that the term brujo is not even as negative as it was back then, right? And wow. and same with the, you know later on, and and you you'll see. So the the terminology here is very important. I mean the the uh, even shaman is not an appropriate term for Don Juan because and that's that's something that you put into a a cultural context of like indigenous cultures, yeah, and it's a very specific role. Now, even though the word bruo has kind of this, but a bruo is, is a bit more than the typical medicine man, right? It's a bruo is somebody who's got powers, not just necessarily mm -hmm. knows about plants and herbs, which you could be, you know, a shaman could just be a, a, a healer and a knowledgeable person on, you know, all different kinds of stuff, right? And somewhat of a, of a you know, a psychologist as well as, a, as an actual healer, right? And, 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 a, and a life coach as well in many cases, right? Culturally, right? Mm -hmm. They provide that. So they, they have, they fill many different roles. But a brujo is very specific about very specific knowledge in addition to the usual medicine man stuff, right? But this term, this terminology is going to be very, very crucial as we're going to see. And Don Juan has trouble with it. He doesn't quite know how to describe himself. He changes over time. So you'll see, you'll see. All right, so please continue, Vina. Yes. Okay. 
at first I saw Don Juan simply as a rather peculiar man who knew a great deal about BOT and who spoke Spanish remarkably well. But that's important, right? That Carlos doesn't yes. really, really pay attention to the implications of Don Juan's ability to speak Spanish remarkably well. It's not that he's speaking Spanish necessarily. It's that he's speaking any language remarkably well, that he is extremely articulate and he's able to elucidate and the sophistication. It, it's just like an anomaly for sort of like, oh, it's peculiar. It's a peculiarity to, to Carlos. It's not significant. And it just shows Carlos's complete bubble arrogance. Unbelievable. But if he, yes, but with people... But the people with whom he lived believed that he had some sort of secret knowledge, that he was a brujo. The Spanish word brujo means in English medicine man, curer, witch, sorcerer. It connotes essentially a person who has extraordinary and usually evil powers. Ah, okay. I had known Don Juan for a whole year before he took me into his confidence. One day he explained that he possessed a certain knowledge that he had learned from a teacher, a benefactor, as he called him, who had directed him in a kind of apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Okay. Don Juan had in turn chosen me to serve as his apprentice, but he warned me that I would have to make a very deep commitment and that he that the training was long and arduous. All right, so this, this, this point about Don Juan having been an apprentice and now choosing Carlos as an apprentice, this was huge. At the time, this the 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 mythology, the hype, the the romance of being an apprentice to somebody like Don Juan was massive. Right? It doesn't have that same allure now, but back then, boy, this was what grabbed and made this book popular, this, this apprentice, Carlos being the apprentice, being chosen to be the apprentice, right? This was a massive big deal. It's hard to, it's hard to communicate today. There's still some of it, but it's not nearly as powerful as it was back then. It's a very big deal. In describing his teacher, Don Juan used the word Diablero. 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 Yeah. Later, I learned that Diablero is, is a term used only by the Sonoran, Sonoran, Sonoran. Okay, Sonoran Indians. It refers to an evil person who practices black sorcery and is capable of transforming himself into an animal, a bird, a dog, a coyote, or any other creature. All right, again, take it with a pinch of salt. This is Carlos's somewhat cultural bias getting involved here, right? I mean, yes, there is some degree of accuracy here, but also not, right? So all of these terms have a variety of applications and interpretations depending on context, right? So let's okay. take, take a bit of grain of salt here. Okay. On one, of, on one of my visits to Sonora, I had a peculiar experience that illustrated the Indians feeling about uh, Diableros. I was driving at night in the company of two Indian friends when I saw an animal that seemed to be a dog crossing the highway. One of my companions said it was not a dog, but a huge coyote. I slowed down and pulled to the side of the road to get a good look at the animal. It stayed within range of the headlights a few seconds longer and then ran into, uh, into the chaparral. Ch chaparral, chaparral. Chaparral, okay. Chaparral, it was unmistakably a coyote, but it was twice the ordinary size. Talking excitedly, my friends agreed that it was a very unusual animal, and one of them suggested that it might be a diablero. I decided to use an account of the experience to question the Indians of that area about their beliefs in the existence of the Averroes. I talked with many people, telling them the story and asking them questions. The three conversations that following that follow indicate what they felt. All right, so just hold Do on one second here, Bina. One, one moment. I just want to fix something here real quick. Let me just... Yes, this font. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to learn Arial. All right, and that took me to the bottom of the file. Yeah, you know, really. Sorry, I, I, I don't know why that comes to no the oddity of how this was done. Uh, right, okay, here we go. Uh, more, yeah, all right. So, these conversations now, these conversations very interesting here. You'll see now why I say that these terms are, are extremely subjective, and you need to understand the full range of it because of the way they, they're supposed to mean and how people actually use them and what they mean in reality. All different, all right, go ahead. Okay, do you think it was a KOT? Yeah. Choi. Koi? This is Choi. Choi. Okay. Okay, do you think it was a KOT, Choi? I asked a young man after he had heard this story. Who knows? A dog? No doubt. Too large for a KOT. Do you think it may have been a uh, Diablero? That's a lot of bull. <laughs> there are no such things. Why do you say that, Choi? People imagine things. I bet if you had caught that animal, you would have seen that it was a dog. Once I had some business in another town and got up before daybreak and settled up a horse. As I was leaving, I came upon a dark shadow on the road, which looked like a huge animal. My horse reared, throwing me off the saddle. I was pretty scared too, but it turned out that the shadow was a woman who was walking to town. Do you mean sure that you don't believe there is a Diableros? Diableros? What? I believe they are Diableros, yeah. Okay. Tell me what a Diablero is. I don't know, Choi. Manuel, who was riding with me uh, that night, said the KOT could have been a Diablero. Maybe you could tell me what a Diablero is. Diablero, they say. Let me scroll, let me scroll. Is, yes is a brewer who changes into any forms he want to adapt, wants to adapt, adopt. But everybody knows that is pure brewer. The old people here are full of stories about Diablos. You won't, you won't find that among us younger people. What kind of animal do you think it was, Donalus? I asked a middle-aged woman. Only God knows that for sure, but I think it was not a purity. There are things that appear to be coyotes, but are not. Was the coyote running or was it eating? It was standing most of the time, but when I first saw it, I think it was eating something. Are you sure it was not carrying something in its mouth? Perhaps it was, but tell me, would that make any difference? Yes, it would. If it was carrying something in its mouth, it was not a coyote. What was it then? It was a man or a woman. What do you call such people, Donald? She did not answer. I questioned her for a while longer, but without success. Finally, she said she did not know. I asked her if such people were called Diaberos, and she answered that Diabero was one of the names given to them. Was do one you... of the names given to them? Yes. Yes. Do you know any Diaberos? I asked. <clears throat> I knew one woman, she replied, she was killed. It happened when I was a little girl. The woman, they said, used to turn into a female dog. And one night, a dog went into the house of a white man to steal cheese. The white man killed the dog with the shotgun. And at the very moment the dog died in the house of the white man, the woman died in her own hut. Her kin got together and went to the white man and demanded payment. The white man paid good money for having killed her. <laughs> it's like, that's preposterous. How could, they demand? How could they demand payment if it was only a dog he killed? They said that, that the white man knew it was not a dog because other people were with him 
and they all saw that the dog stood up on its leg like a man and reached for the cheese, which was on a tray hanging from the roof. The men were waiting for the thief because the white man's cheese was being stolen every night. Ha. Huh. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. So the man killed the thief knowing it was not a dog. Are there any dead bearers nowadays, Donalus? Such things are not are very secret. They say there are no more Diablerus, but I doubt it because one member of a Diablerus family has to learn what the Diablerus know Diablero knows. Okay. Diablerus have their own laws. And one of them is that a Diablero has to teach his secrets to one of his kin. What do you think the animal was? Gennaro. 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 Okay. Gennaro. I asked a very old man, a dog from one of the ranches of the area. What else? At least that's where I you... pronounce it. Maybe maybe it's Gennaro. I don't know. But yes. I, I say Gennaro. I don't know. Okay. It could be been a Diablero. A Diablero, you are crazy. There are no Diableros. Do you mean that there are none today or that there never were any? At one time there were. Yes, it is common knowledge. Everybody knows that. But the people were very afraid of them and had them all killed. All right, Who so now something out? else that's important, right? We have yes. to pay attention to how people use language, right? It could have been a Diablero. A Diablero, you're crazy. There are no Diableros. Now, uh, on the face of it, if you use common logic, kind of scientific logic, that's an absolute statement. There are no Diableros, right? Yeah. He's not saying there are no today or none. He's saying as a fact. In other words, this is something that's like saying there are no fairies, right? They did not, you know, most people will say they never existed. Right, and that, but but this is how people talk. Even though he's saying it in a way that, on its face, means that they never existed, it's not what he means. What he says and what he means, not the same. And this is common. We have to pay attention to this, right? And not just in life in general, but in the book itself also, right? So you have to really look at nuance of meaning here. And it's to Carlos's credit that he asks this follow-up question. Right, that's good anthropology there, and because otherwise he could have just taken his notes and said, "Well, you know." And if he got that far in the conversation, he could easily say, "Well, people don't believe in diableros, right?" But this guy does believe in them, just not today. See, very powerful, very, very important to have this discernment. In other words, okay. who killed them, Gennaro? All the people of the tribe. The last Diablero I knew about was S. He killed dozens, maybe even hundreds of people with his sorcery. He couldn't put up with that. And the people got together and took him by surprise one night and burned him alive. Oh my God. How long ago was that, Gennaro? In 1942. Did you see it yourself? No. But people still talk about, talk about it. They say that there were no ashes left, even though the steak was made of fresh wood. All that was left at the end was a huge pool of grease. <laughs> Very interesting. So this is roughly 25 years afterwards, more or less, you know. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Although Don Juan categorized his benefactor as a diablero, he never mentioned the place where he had acquired his knowledge, nor did he identify his teachers. In fact, Don Juan discussed, disclosed very little about his personal life. All he said was that he had been born in the Southwest in 1891, that he had spent nearly all his life in Mexico, that uh, in 1900, his family was exiled by the Mexican government to central Mexico, along with thousands of others, uh, Sonoran Indians, and that he had lived in central and southern Mexico until 1940, 
Thus, says Don Juan, had traveled a great deal, his knowledge may have been the product of many influences. And although he regarded himself as an Indian from Sonora, Sonora, uh, I was not sure whether to place the context of his knowledge totally in the culture of the Sonoran Indians, but it is not my intention here to determine his precise cultural milieu. Milieu, yes. Part? All right, so, so this is something that it's part of academia, right? You are the product of some influence, right? And, and so if you like yaki, oh, you're a yaki, right? But again, when you actually grow up, how many people do we grow up and even though you grow up in this culture, you don't necessarily take on that culture. You don't necessarily have that. Some do, some don't. But it's this idea that everybody is, is influenced by something. There's no concept in, well, in, in academia and just popular psychology. There's just not allowance for people getting influences from many places. And there's no allowance for people creating their own path, their own influence. None. Just none, none available, none. It's amazing. Just absolutely fascinating how you always are a product of something, this belief. You can't possibly create yourself, which is, of course, absolute total rubbish, right? Okay. Yeah. So he starts okay. with Don Juan in 1960. He only, he yeah. only publishes this book much later, right? So this is very important to see the, the, the gap here, right? Yeah. I, I began to serve my apprenticeship yeah. to Don Juan in June 1961. June is important. I love that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Prior to that time, I had seen him on various occasions, but always in the capacity of an anthropolog anthropological observer. During these early conversations, I took notes in a covert manner later Relying on my memory, I reconstructed the entire conversation when I began to participate as an apprentice. However, that method of taking notes became very difficult because our conversations touched on many different topics. Then Don Juan allowed me, under strong protest, however, to record openly anything that was said. I would also have liked to take photographs and make tape recordings, but he would not permit me to do so. <laughs> we're going to have a nice fun perspective on Carlos taking these secret notes later. <laughs> it's very funny. Yes. <laughs> Carlos. I carried out, God teases Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> I carried out the apprenticeship first in Arizona and then in uh, Sonora because Don Juan moved to Mexico during the course of my training. The procedure I employed was to see him for a few days every so often. My visits become became more frequent and lasted longer during the summer months of 1961 to 1963 and 64. In retrospect, I believe this method of conducting the apprenticeship prevented the training from being successful ah, because uh, it retarded the advent of the full commitment I needed to become a sorcerer, yet the method was beneficial from my personal standpoint in that it allowed me to modicum of detachment and that in turn fostered a sense of critical examination which would have been impossible to attain had I participated continuously without interruption. In September 1965, one voluntarily discontinued. I, I, it's supposed to be I. Oh, oh yes. I voluntarily discontinued. Dis continued the apprenticeship. Several months after my withdrawal, I considered for the first time the idea of arranging my field notes in a systematic way, as the data I had collected were quite voluminous and included much miscellaneous information. I began by trying to establish a classification system. I divided the data into areas of related concepts and procedures and arranged the areas Hierarchically, hierarchy. Uh, <laughs> say it please. Hierarchically. Hierarchically, according to subjective importance. Thank you. That is in terms of the impact that each of them had had on me. 
In that way, I arrived at the following classification. Uses of uh, hallucinogenic. Okay, Hallucinogen hallucinogenic. Hallucinogenic plants, procedures and formulas used in sorcery, accusation and manipulation of power objects, uses of medicinal plants, songs and legends. All right, so this this now we're starting to see Carlos's academics come out, right? He's had six years of interaction with Don Juan and he's still in this bubble of academia, okay? Yes. When he's writing this, look how he, and, and this year, we are going to see, it's like, man, boy, did he ever miss the boat, but all right. <laughs> it's fascinating. Okay. Reflecting upon the phenomena I had experienced, I realized that my attempts at classification had produced nothing more than an inventory of categories. Any attempt to refine my scheme would therefore yield only a more complex inventory. That was not what I wanted. During the months following my uh, withdrawal from the apprenticeship, I needed to understand what I had experienced and what I had experienced was a teaching of coherent system of beliefs by means of uh, pragmatic and experimental methods. It had been evident to me from the very first session in which I had participated that Don Juan's teachings possessed an eternal cohesion. That's very important, right? This, it had been evident to me from the very first session in which I had participated that Don Juan's teachings possessed an internal cohesion, yet he does not respond to that, even though he's aware of it. It's fascinating how his cultural bias prevents him from paying attention to the implications. Once he had definitely decided to communicate his knowledge to me, he proceeded to present his explanations in orderly steps. To discover that order and to understand it, to understand it, proved to be a most difficult task. Right, so at least he recognizes it here, right? That that yes. to discover that order and to understand it proved to be a most difficult task for me. Why? Because he did not have the ability to perspective shift. Simple mm. as that, right? My no. inability to arrive at an understanding seems to have been uh, traceable to the fact that after four years of apprenticeship, I was still a beginner. It was clear that Don Juan's knowledge and his method of conveying it were those, <laughs> okay, were those of his benefactor. Thus, my difficulties in understanding his teachings must have been analogous. To analogous, those analogous. Analogous, okay. Analogous, thank you. Analogous to those he himself had encountered. Wow, look at this arrogance here. Yes. Thus, my difficulties in understanding his teachers must have, ugh, 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 whenever you hear must have, just pause, pause. And uh, usually this is inappropriate assumption, almost always, right? Must have been analogous to those he himself had accounted. Why? Because you're an idiot who can't understand. Are you assuming Don Juan had difficulty? Why? No basis for it whatsoever, uh, except the assumption that if I struggle, uh, then others will struggle with, with learning some material, then it must be difficult for everybody. The arrogance of it, the unbelievable arrogance of it. <laughs> Incredible, no? Yes. <laughs> Don Juan alluded to our similarity as beginners through incidental comments about his incapacity to understand his teachers during his own apprenticeship. Right. But now Carlos has been, I mean, Don Juan is kind of being very kind. Yes, he didn't understand. He was also an income poop in his own way. But it's not really a comparison, right? I mean, we'll, we'll hear Don Juan's story of his apprenticeship later, and we'll see the differences. There are similarities, but not quite the same. They were both in bubbles of ignorance and income poopery and belief bubbles which prevented them from learning. The belief bubble is very potent here. Yeah. And it's a very powerful term, right? 
It's not a term yes. on one uses, but we're going to see it. Just bubbles in general, psychological bubbles, emotional bubbles, and particularly belief bubbles. We're going to see how they severely, severely, really impact perception, understanding, awareness, and limit, limit, severely limit. And it's very hard to break out of those if you don't know you're in it. Very big deal. Yeah. Oh. Must have been uh, analogous to those he himself had encountered. John Vaughan alluded to our similarity as beginners through incidental comments about his incapac incapacity to understand his teacher's uh, teacher due to his own apprenticeship. Such oh. remarks led me to believe that to any beginner, Indian or non-Indian, the knowledge of sorcery was rendered incomprehensible by the outlandish characteristics of the phenomena he experienced. Personally, as a Western man, I found these characteristics so bizarre that it was virtually impossible to explain them in terms of my own everyday life. And I was forced to the conclusion that any attempt to classify my field data in my own terms would be futile. Futile, right. So this, this, this classification of the field data in his own terms and, and this classification and all of this academic stuff, it, it's a big deal for Carlos because he's all involved in this hype and the status of being an ac academic and blah, and blah, right? Uh, mm. It's just no, again, he's relating it. He even calls it data. His relationship to what Don Juan shares with him is as data, not as personal value. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Big shift. Big shift. I mean, it, it changes everything. All right. It's yes. very useful to us because because of Carlos being an idiot, Don Juan tries a whole range of different ways to get through to him. And so as a result, we get to see the fullness of what Don Juan is all about, right? Which would not have been shared if Carlos had gotten it. Right? You wouldn't have to go over and over, try this, try that, try it. Yeah. yeah. So Carlos's idiocy is the universe, the universe choosing Carlos for this. I, 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 was, I was keeping it in my mind that Don won't choose him uh, to be his apprentice, uh, which means that it is whatever is coming from uh, Carlos' side was, was accepted and kind of needed uh, that... Uh, don't no. one might have like need that no. that kind of apprentice for some reason for some unknown reason i must say so <laughs> i'm just uh, keeping right, this so there, that's mind. the reason right the reason is that carlos's absolute idiocy forces don Juan to share the in the full range or at least such a huge we don't know if it's full but it's pretty close I mean, by implication we can see or at least extensive uh, sharing of everything that Don Juan knows. Now, we're going to see later on Don Juan's uh, body of understanding and knowledge is complex because things changed in his lineage, right? It used to be a certain way and then things updated and changed. So there's sort of the old system and the newer system. And he talks about that later on, right? And, and on all of the sharing, though, we get because Carlos doesn't get it. He needs to hear things over and over, not only, but from different perspectives, right? Don Juan keeps trying to get through to him. And as a result, we benefit because we see the, the, the vastness and the range of Don Juan's perception and yes. understanding and knowledge. Yes. Thus, it became obvious to me that Don Juan's knowledge had to be examined in terms of how he himself understood it. Only in such terms could it be made evident and convincing. In trying to reconcile my own views with Don Juan's, however, I realized that whenever he tried to explain his knowledge to me, he used concepts that would render it intelligible to him. As those concepts were alien to me, trying to understand his knowledge in the way he did place me in another unattainable position. Untenable. Um, yes, untenable position. Therefore, my first task was to determine his order of conceptualization. While working in that direction, I saw that Don Juan himself had placed particular emphasis on a certain area of his teachings, specifically the uses of hallucinogenic. 
hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic. Thank you, hallucinogenic to plants. On the basis of this realization, I revised my own scheme of categories. One one used separately and on different occasions, three hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic. <laughs> Sorry, it is too difficult for me. No, okay. it's not. No, it's not. Just say hallucinogenic. 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 Uh, plants, peyote. Uh, Lephophora. Lephophora, William Sai. Lephophora. Uh, will, what is William C? William okay. Sai. William Sai, Jimson Weed, Detora, Enoxia, Sin, D. Meta, Lodius. Yeah. And a mushroom, possibly. Uh, what is the word here? Silocybe. Okay, Silocybe Mexicana. Yeah, again, and see, Carlos getting all like... technical, yeah, right? Getting all academic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Since before their contact with Europeans, American Indians uh, have known the hallucinogenic uh, properties of these three plants because of their properties, the plants have been widely employed for pleasure for curing, for witchcraft, and for attaining a state of ecstasy. In the specific context of his teachings, Don Juan related the use of the Tura Inoxia and Silocybe Mexicana uh, to the acquisition of power, the, a power he called an ally. He related the use of Lufufura, Lufufura uh, William, William Sai. William Sai. Yeah. The Fofora William side to the accusation of wisdom or the knowledge of the right way to live. I mean, I guess wow. you could say William Sai. I don't want to be really technical about it, but I think the typical yes. pronunciation is just William Sai. The importance of the plants was for Don Juan, their capacity to produce the stages of peculiar perception in a human being. Thus, he guided me into experiencing a sequence of these stages for the purpose of unfolding and validating his knowledge. I have called them states of non-ordinary reality. All right, all right, all right, let's just pause right there. I have called them states of non-ordinary reality. Back then, this simple sentence, this term non-ordinary reality was huge. Today, it's like, eh, no big deal, non-ordinary reality. All right, yeah, we, 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 we sort of accept it, right? Back then, it yeah. was revelation, a revolution. It was a massive big deal because the idea that somebody is proposing that there is such a thing as a non-ordinary reality, this freaked people out, blew their minds. It was like a whole big hullabaloo of just uh, conceptual disruption. It's amazing. It's amazing how in a relatively short period of time, right? We're talking 40, 50 years, how everything changed, right? Yes. Now, and now today it's like alternative reality, whatever, right? I mean, again, this alternative reality comes from Carlos. Yes. That's book two. It's called An Alternative Reality. It's transformational. Oh. He, he's changed our language, right? This comes from Carlos. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Don Juan, really, but you know, anyway. Okay. I have called them states of non ordinary reality, meaning unusual reality as opposed to the ordinary reality of everyday life. The distinction is based on the inherent meaning of the states of non ordinary reality. In the context of Don Juan's knowledge, they were considered as real, although their reality was differenti differentiated from ordinary reality. All right. So, this is very important, yeah. right? They were considered yes. as real. Again, this is a stick point for Carlos. He gets very stuck on this. And we're going to see how this holds him back profoundly. Now, in these, these terms, these concepts don't necessarily originate with Carlos. Right? As those guys who were the debunkers, right? the one guy especially says, oh, everything Carlos stole from everywhere. Right? Um, if he misses the point that the stuff was around everywhere uh, that makes the stuff itself have some validity. But anyway, so this, this point about realness and accuracy, all this, 
They get stuck on this. They get stuck on this. But like I said, Carlos doesn't necessarily originate much of this because it's been in the centuries here, there, and everywhere. But he popularizes it and he brings it into the psyche. And, and as a result, it's in our language now, but it's primarily due to Carlos because so much came from Carlos, right? He's, he's, he's kind of the catalyst that shifts things and moves things along. And he really puts this into a whole different, I mean, shamanism today, you know, you, you have, I don't know, people talk about shamanism and I'm a practicing shaman, you know, like Brenda, or whoever, right? It's, it's sort of a, well, just a thing that people do, but it's all started here, all started here, right? You can trace it back. So it's very important to be aware of that this is fresh at the time. It's new. It's revolutionary. It's it's transformative, and it really grabs the imagination, right? I mean, these were these were, you know, best-selling books at the time, right? Yeah. Yes. And it started a whole genre of it, by the way. I mean, today it is just 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 people who are writing about Carlos and Don Juan who claim to be associated and connected, uh, there's a couple of dozen of them. <laughs> mm. Fascinating. Uh, you know, that's just tight, you know, but then in related, you know, like I say, Michael Ohana who really popularized shamanism. And I think he, he taught how to be a shaman uh, way, I think in the seventies or eighties, somewhere around there, uh, you know, but that, that shifted things and so much changed as a result of this. Very powerful. It's, it's hard to it's hard to be aware of things when you don't know the absence of it because when you are familiar with things, you take it for granted. Right? It's very hard to imagine mm -hmm. the absence. Please continue, Vina. Yes. Okay. No. Uh, I think now we will stop here. Because, oh yeah, uh, I was I was keen to get to the end of the um the, this of this introduction here. But I think we'll just leave it here, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the importance of the plants was for Don Juan. We'll start there tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So then we will go into the more detail about it. Yeah. Yeah. I I, um, I, I, I didn't remember that his introduction was so long. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it is good that it is, it is long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's important. Okay. Yeah. So far, uh, I'm enjoying this because, oh, yeah. uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, it, it helped me really, it helped a lot to me that. Uh, paying attention to attunement. I am just paying attention to attunement, no. that how things work, how no. Don Juan uh, no. actually uh, choose this person who was a complete, like in a contrast to him. He didn't choose. Yes. Don Juan will tell you, I did no such thing. Oh. Attunement pointed him out. H how yes. is that him choosing? There's no okay, choice involved. I, I understand. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. See, yes. see, see. Yes. I mean, yes, <laughs> it's it's true in a sense, but from Don Juan's perspective, and and later on he will say, I, I had no choice in the matter. It is nothing personal. Yeah. Wonderful. So Wonderful. see, that's this is a very key point. I'm glad you used those words of him choosing because Don Juan would absolutely say, no, I did not choice. Attunement chose. And me, as living in attunement, I go along with it. It's out of my hands entirely. I have nothing personal in it whatsoever. I choose to live in attunement or not. That's the only choice I have. See? Very powerful. Again, this is yes. absolutely crucial to understand. And I've never seen anyone ever uh, share a perspective. If you want to understand on one and the soul callous readings, to come at it through the frame of perspective of attunement. Absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. Yeah. And it's frame of perception as well. It changes everything. When you look at it through the lens of attunement, you see a whole different story. You see a whole different reality. You see the universe involved. Not Don Juan is not the principal actor. It's the universe is the principal actor. The universe put Carlos and Don Juan together. Don Juan was able to recognize it. Carlos was not. Yes. Yes. It's not Don Juan who is the main character, but the universe or spirit, yes. if you want to yes. call it that. 
Which very important. Is very important. Yes. Very, very, yes. very important, right? Yes. It's why okay. attunement, the word, the concept of attunement is so powerful. Don Juan does not name it, doesn't have a name for it. Yes. Norma says, I'm looking forward to the continuation. So different from the way oh, yes. I read. Yes, this is this yes. is this capital R reading uh, uh, Norma. It is very different. Plus, this is a, a subject, a topic, these books. I am, this is something I've studied extensively, right? And, 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 and I lived it, lived through the time of it also. So I'm not only sharing my extensive studying of it, but also its connection to the, to the cultural, cultural milieu or the cultural times and the shifting and the influence, right? So I'm able to provide a lot extra to just a usual reading. And also, I've taken all of this. I had my own philosophy created before, which I didn't know. But I've also taken what's here and taken it further. Like the word attunement, the concept attunement. Don Juan doesn't use it, but he, he, he implies it. He says it in, in, in a not, so, not, not such an, a, 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 a precise way and such a, 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 a large way. Right? So I'm taking a lot further. And like I said, this concept of attunement, when we understand this whole story is about attunement, changes everything, changes absolutely everything. So I'm bringing a massiveness of my own, like Don Juan, Carlos said, Don Juan had this massive cohesive body of knowledge. Well, I do too. And I'm bringing that to bear here. Attunement yes. is one such, right? Yes. Uh, Don yes. Juan, I mean, Don Juan does mention its importance, but because he doesn't have the term for it or doesn't use one that we know of, it doesn't quite get communicated as being as important as it is. And Carlos doesn't get it how important it is, right? We'll see. He does say it, but Carlos misses it. He doesn't get it. So, yeah, it's very interesting stuff, uh, Norma. We are embarking on a most magical journey. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, my memory was from reading many years ago. Wish I'd known you then. Uh, yes, uh, many people touched on Carlos, but few finished Carlos, few used Don Juan, few took it as a starting point. They saw it as an ending point, as a totality, not realizing it's a beginning. And when you see it as a beginning to explore in whichever path works for you, because it's a path of getting started on a path of attunement. And when we see it that way, it changes everything. So yeah, there, there's so, so much magic to come. I mean, this is a, I've been keen to do this for a long time. So much more this year, so much more this year. Tons of it, yes. tons of it. So we're going to have fun, okay. Norma. And this is a long yes. journey, right? I mean, yes. it's, we're going to be reading 13 books at least. Uh, we'll probably read the introduction yes. of book, book the, the 14th book, yeah. Even though I think it's actually book 13 or book 12, but still. Uh, yes, book 12. But, but you know, because the introductions, he, he repeats that introduction many times. He tells the same story, but from, from the updates, right? As he remembers different things, emphasizes different things. So we're going to hear that story of him meeting Don Juan many times. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Very fun. Lots of, lots yes. of fun stuff. Okay. Yes. It's most yes. brilliant, Norma. Okay. Most brilliant. Yes. We gotta yes. go. Okay, we thank gotta you so go. much, Norma. Go. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing the, oh, all pleasure. this context because this is this is the actual pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, backbone for this whole capital yeah. R reading yeah. process. Yeah. And of course, this capital R reading is special for me. And yeah. I hope that for other people also, we will see you hopefully, you guys, tomorrow at the same time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and we will continue with this introduction, and then yeah. we will go. Tomorrow, I will have my own uh, reading for that. Like, okay, I will have on my screen so I can make notes, which I missed today. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. So yes. Yeah, we will be more organized. Well, there hasn't, been, there hasn't been anything to really pull as a quote yet. We'll for me, yes. Not quotes, right. but yes, some notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not yet, but okay. we'll get there. So, yeah, that's important. Yes. Uh, Norma okay. says, bye, Bina. Oh, thank you, Norma. Yes, bye, Norma. And uh, hope to see you tomorrow also. Yes. Uh, if you guys are watching us live and uh, for, uh, for people who are going to uh, watch us recorded, please do like, subscribe and comment on these posts, on this post yeah. especially if you want to know more about Don Juan and Carlos. 
because this subject is something very influential in the whole Western culture. Yes, in the East, it is, oh. it is a different thing. But in the Western culture, in the Western awareness culture, it's a completely different thing. So please do pay attention to that. And if you want to more, have more in, this li in your life, please make an effort to click like and subscribe uh, to this type of channel, not only to ours, but also others. Yes. Thank you so much yes. for joining us. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Yeah. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. And meeting and...